Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UHN Foundation Speaker Series on Movement Disorders. It's our first as a hybrid event, so I want to welcome our guests here in the BMO Centre uh, in the Kremble Discovery Tower, as well as those, uh, those of you who are joining us via the live stream. Uh, we're grateful to all of you, our family of supporters, and so glad you're able to join us today. I'm Christian Cote, host of the uh, podcast uh, Behind the Breakthrough, the UHN podcast about groundbreaking medical research here at UHN as well as the people behind it. Uh, for today's event, we want to, of course, again, give special credit to Dr. Fraser, or Mr. Fraser Barrow. This Movement Disorder Speaker Series is made possible because of his continuing generosity and support. So thank you again, Mr. Barrow. As always, we want to we want you in the audience to join us in the conversation today. So for those of you on the live stream, if a question comes to mind, please send it in by going to the Slido page. There should be a link at the bottom of your screen at this point. Uh, click on that link and type in the event code, which is hashtag MDS series. That's MDS series, all one word. Enter your question and please keep in mind, we can't really field any questions of a personal medical nature. Uh, and for those of you here with us today at the BMO Center, uh, we've got a couple of rov roving microphones available. If you look at the back, one of our roving microphone people, Jen, is at the back there. If you, after Dr. Lang's uh, talk today, have a question, Jen or Kaylin, our other roving microphone, will come to you with the microphone so you can ask a question. That's all coming up later in the hour, but first, we're very excited to bring you actually some groundbreaking international research that signals a paradigm shift in Parkinson's research. It's designed to advance research on multiple levels, including earlier diagnosis of the disease, new treatments to slow the progression, and ultimately, a cure for Parkinson's. The, this pioneering research is based on a new way of classifying the disease, something called synergy. And you're going to hear a lot more about it from Dr. Tony Lang, who is the Senior Research Investigator of Synergy. Dr. Lang is Director of the Edmund J. Safra Program in Parkinson's Disease. He is the Morton and Gloria Shulman Movement Disorders Clinic, as well as the Rossi Progressive Supranuclear Palsy Center. So if everyone could please welcome Dr. Tony Lang. Christian. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Toronto Western and uh, UHN, and welcome to our speaker series. Um, we began the speaker series some years ago for a couple of reasons, uh, particularly one to educate and update you and give you the latest developments as they relate to what we do here. So to give you a sense of the kind of work that we do. And uh, over the years, we've given you presentations from pretty well every aspect of the Movement Disorders program that I'm going to update you on today. So number one, education. Number two, uh, introducing you to some of the research work that we're doing. Um, and to thank you for the support that you provide to our program if you're a supporter. Um, I should say that uh, in previous years, I've not mentioned money. I'm going to mention it very briefly today, and that is to tell you that this is a very expensive endeavor, research in particular, but also the patient care we provide. And I'm going to uh, highlight that in a couple of uh, slides uh, in a second. But uh, again, uh, we can't do what we do without philanthropy and the support that we get from our patients and their families in particular. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to initially tell you a little bit about what's going on in the program. And then as Christian told you, I'm gonna tell you something that I've been involved in for the last over a year now, really, really trying to highlight how we need to change our thinking about Parkinson's and actually most other neurodegenerative diseases. I appreciate that not everyone that we see in the Movement Disorders Clinic has Parkinson's. We don't want to just emphasize one disease. Today I'm going to emphasize some research related to that though, but I don't want to ignore the other conditions that we deal with. And certainly if you have questions related to those other conditions, don't hesitate to ask. So let's move on. Uh, this is not advancing the slides. The, hmm, I'm left clicking till my heart is, okay, it just didn't. Okay, so here's the 
Kremble Brain Institute, the Toronto Western Hospital Un uh, Movement Disorders Clinic is held in this. So this is the front. And here's an older picture where you can see the CN Tower. But now we have a wonderful research building, Kremble Discovery Tower, that we're in right now that was built uh, and sort of covered this up. So it's here at the back now. And this is not moving at all. Okay. so. Before COVID, we could all get together. We're now able to do that again without masks on, but uh, this was the last time our whole unit had to get together. And one of the things I'd like to mention is, that, again, this is an expensive endeavor. Uh, it turns out that if we put all the salaries and expenses of everyone here and all of the others that we're missing here, uh, including our research fellows, our coordinators, our nurses, our clerical staff, it's a $3.5 million effort. And in fact, hardly any of that comes from OHIP and from the hospital's budget. We have to raise that from research support, from philanthropy and other sources. And so it's a very expensive demo that I think you're going to see is making a difference. We have 11 full-time faculty in movement disorders now. And you see their names listed here with their faces. You've met many of them over the course of these uh, speaker series. And uh, they've all told you about the kind of work and research they're involved with. And I just point out this bald guy, good looking guy here, if my pointer would advance the slide, is Christos Ganos, who will be joining us in January 2024 with an exper expertise in both rare movement disorders, but especially in Tourette's syndrome, which is also a neurological disorder or a neuropsychiatric disorder that we specialize in. We also collaborate with basic scientists in this building and on one of the floors above us is what's called the TAN Center for Research in Neurodegenerative Diseases. It's a University of Toronto affiliated research unit that has a number of investigators that don't want to come onto the screen just yet, but they will. Um, and you can just see some of their names listed here. We won't go through the details, but you can see at the bottom that we have researchers involved both in Parkinson's disease and this other condition that Christian mentioned, progressive supranuclear palsy, which is another neurodegenerative disease that can sometimes mimic Parkinson's. It's more malignant or more severe than Parkinson's, and so we really need some important breakthroughs, and we were very fortunate through the Rossi Foundation to be able to develop this program and, and build and recruit, and I'll show you some uh, slide eventually about that. In the, nerd, in the Center for Research in Neurodegenerative Diseases, CRND, TAN CRND, we do research in many different fields. And you can just scan this to see the extent of the type of research that goes on anywhere from cellular biology all the way through to um, proteins that are changing in the cells to molecular genetics through to uh, all aspects of how and why these brain cells are dying and what we might be able to do to change the course of that degeneration. And so we have a large number of investigators working in that field. In the Rossi program that's been built only in the last three and a half years or so, we have really developed a world-class organization. I was just in an international meeting in London, England late last week, and one of the world leaders in progressive supranuclear palsy got up to the podium and said, when I do searches, I can't believe what's going on in Toronto. The number of papers that are coming out from Toronto are blowing everybody else away, thanks to this incredible team that you see here on, on the screen. And again, I won't go through the details, but this is happening now and very, very, very exciting. The contributions that the team that we've built, not just in the Rossi program, but the Movement Disorders program, have had contributions in many fields. And you can just scan this list to see that we've done clinical studies describing new aspects of Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders, developing criteria upon which we can diagnose the condition, and that's the major point that I'll be talking about in a few minutes through to developing models of these conditions in certain kinds of animals. Dr. Kalia has spoken to you not that long ago about some of the work she has done in the animal models, through to understanding basic mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, eventually, hopefully, coming to advancing our therapeutic approach. 
The next point I want to mention, though, is that we are educating future leaders in the field. We have the largest fellowship program in movement disorders, really, I think, in the world. Certainly, it's the largest in North America. And again, if these slides would advance, you would see um, a collage of pictures of all of the fellows that we've had over the last several years. And in the last two years, you see we've had 21 fellows from multiple countries, and this um, um, atlas picture shows you all the countries that uh, people have come to work in Toronto, to study under myself and my colleagues, and in many cases return to their uh, home base and lead programs. So we've trained people who are now professors and chairman of departments who are caring for and advancing science in their own countries. So for example, at the meeting I told you about in London, two of our ex-fellows, one from uh, Malaysia and the other from India, were senior professors presenting at the podium. And it was really, I had uh, a beaming smile on my face of pride recognizing the contribution we've made to the advancing work in their uh, countries and the care that they're providing to many patients around the world. Very quickly, if I can get this thing to advance the slides a little faster, <laughs> I thought what I would do is show you a few slides related to the research that can advance the screen, please. Maybe I'll just say next slide. So I'm gonna show you uh, some studies that we've been involved in because I'm speaking today as opposed to one of my colleagues. They'll be mainly papers that I've been pr principally involved in. This was a study we published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last year. Uh, one of the first studies using an antibody against a protein that accumulates in Parkinson's with the hope that it would be removed and the brain would be able to improve. We're gonna talk about that protein in a minute. Unfortunately, this and another study with a different antibody fail, but that doesn't mean we stop. That means we learn from that experience and move on. And in fact, it's for that very reason that this past year, Alzheimer's has seen huge breakthroughs, including these monoclonal antibodies against the proteins that are accumulating in the Alzheimer brain. So we really believe that that's the beginning of similar breakthroughs in other neurodegenerations like Parkinson's. But you gotta fail first, and you go back to the drawing board, you learn from that failure and move on. Next slide, please. Now you're going backwards. <laughs> Okay, um, we do a, a lot of um, uh, imaging studies, and this is one imaging study where we looked at the dopamine transporter scans. Next, please. One of the big questions that has been a part of our work in Parkinson's for many, many years is how best to treat patients. You're, those with Parkinson's here are probably, is this where, those with Parkinson's here are very familiar with some of the side effects of levodopa. And there was an era where everybody was afraid to use the best drug we have for Parkinson's. And this uh, um, guideline committee, or subcommittee that I helped lead, um, reviewed all of the literature and really put levodopa back in its place as the best drug and probably the, um, the first drug we should be using in most patients with Parkinson's disease. You've gone the wrong way, next. Uh, and this was a study where we asked the question, did it matter how you started the treatment for Parkinson's when you needed surgery for Parkinson's? Dr. Fasano and Dr. Munoz has talked to you about deep brain stimulation over the last couple of years. And so we asked, did it matter? Did you start needing deep brain stimulation earlier if you were treated in one way or the other? And in fact, it didn't matter at all. So there was a good reason to think that levodopa was something that we should be using early rather than later. People used to be afraid of it, thinking it would force us to need the surgery earlier. Next slide. This is a genetic study that was conducted by one of our colleagues in the TAN Center that I told you about, Dr. Rogiva. You'll see her, she's the second last author on this paper. And this took a group of patients with a particular gene that causes Parkinson's, and then we looked to see whether that was influenced by what we call the epigenetic clock. Now, epigenetics relates to how the environment changes your genes. Believe it or not, you can have an identical twin, and genetically you are not identical because of the influence of your environment on your genes. So even though you're identical in all the standard genetic ways, 
the environment have changed your genes over the existence, over the life that you've had being exposed to the environment. And we now have the ability to look at how the environment has changed your genetics by what's called the epigenetic clock. It's something called methylation of certain parts of your DNA. And Dr. Regeva and our colleagues found that if you had genetics that suggested you aged faster, so you can be um, 60 years old and you know some 60 year olds look like they're 40 and others look like they're 80 and there's something different there, right? You're biologically 60 but you're physiologically either 40 or 80. So your physiology allows you to be younger or older and in fact we believe that that relates to the way the environment has changed your DNA. And the epigenetic clock is a way of looking at that question and we actually found that was an important factor. Next please. We also found in this gene that causes Parkinson's, LRRK2, the commonest, what we call dominant form of genetic Parkinson's, uh, being exposed to certain drugs like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories actually changed how early you manifested the disease. So having an anti-inflammatory treatment may have changed the way the progressive degeneration manifested. And there's a lot of interest in the role of inflammation in the brain in all neurodegenerative diseases. Next, please. The other thing you probably have heard about in all of medicine is the role of what's going on in your gut. All those little bacteria in your bowel movements, in fact, can influence any medical disease you can imagine. This is big in diabetes, it's big in cancer, and it's also very big in neurodegenerative diseases. And this is a review paper by some colleagues and myself that discussed what we call the microbiome, the gut-brain access. And so the gut can influence what's going on in, in the brain. You can get inflammation related to the bacteria in your gut that then can influence the way your brain functions. And there's a great deal of interest, believe it or not, and if I get the pointer here, whoops, can we go? Believe it or not, the treatment, have you ever heard of C. difficile? The infection of the bowel that causes horrible diarrhea, many patients die of C. difficile. The treatment for C. difficile is to remove all of the bacteria in your gut and replace it with normal bacteria. You have what's called a fecal transplantation, putting normal poop into your colon, believe it or not. And in fact, there are people that are pursuing fecal transplantation in Parkinson's disease with the same idea that maybe we should be replacing the abnormal microbiome that exists in the Parkinsonian gut. We're, not, we're near thinking about doing that for everybody, but just for, so that you know, that's a field that is being pursued actively. Okay, now, believe it or not, I haven't even gotten to what my main topic is, and that is to tell you about this idea that myself and colleagues came up with based on how our concepts of the biology of Parkinson's are changing. So what we've been doing, okay, th thank you. Um, didn't do that, did you see that? I, I did that without touching a thing. Um, you need to know this word, alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein is a protein that has many normal functions in the brain. But in Parkinson's disease, that protein accumulates and becomes abnormal. And if we develop stains against the alpha-synuclein, we can actually see a tremendous amount of this alpha-synuclein. This is what's called a Lewy body. I don't know whether any of you have heard of that, but the Lewy body, L-E-W-Y, was described in the early 1900s when a pathologist looking under slides, looking at brain specimens, saw these what are called inclusion bodies. And he didn't know anything about alpha-synuclein at the time. They were named after him, Levy or Louis. And now with alpha-synuclein stains, we know that the Louis body is made up largely, but not exclusively, of alpha-synuclein. And you see a large amount of this brown substance indicating alpha-synuclein is accumulating in the Parkinson brain. So it's very important to the pathology. And we now know, next slide or next press, that you can have a genetic abnormality in the gene that makes that protein. This SNCA, you see that on the slide? SNCA is the gene for alpha-synuclein. And we now know that mutations in that gene, or even too many copies of the gene, are capable of causing Parkinson's disease. 
and that Parkinson's is associated with the aggregation and accumulation of the alpha-synuclein protein. So this was all really important clues to the uh, critical nature of the protein deposited in the Parkinson brain. We now know, in fact, that all neurodegenerative diseases that we know of relate to certain proteins, all different proteins. That PSP disease that I told you about, the protein is called tau, different protein, but accumulating in the same way as alpha-synuclein is accumulating in the Parkinson brain. Next, please. So unfortunately, I really need a slide that moves forward. So um, here's, for example, alpha-synuclein floating around in its doing its normal thing doing its normal task. Unfortunately, for reasons we don't understand, in some ways, because of the mutations in that protein, for example, or in the gene, that protein becomes what we call misfolded. And when the protein misfolds, it develops sheets. It accumulates together. One misfolded protein attaches to another protein and makes it misfolded, attaches to another protein and makes it misfolded. And you develop what are called fibrils. Next, please. And so this misfolded protein inducing misfolding in another protein is called permissive templating. The template of the abnormal protein permits and causes misfolding in a normal protein. And those accumulate. They make these sheets, so-called beta pleated sheets. Next, please. Next, please. And then those form the Lewy bodies. And the abnormal protein, we believe, then is capable of moving from one cell to another. So now in neurodegenerative diseases, we think that the abnormal protein spreads from one nerve cell to another and induces that misfolding in another cell. And the degenerative proce uh, process continues to progress and then triggers a whole bunch of other things. You don't need to know any of these details at all. We don't understand half of this, but we recognize that there are a lot of different cellular processes that are triggered. Inflammation, I mentioned one. Something wrong with your energy producing components of the cells, the mitochondria. Many different things are listed here. You don't need to know the details at all. Just to know, next please, that this permissive templating and the development of these abnormal alpha-synuclein aggregates, we think is the first trigger. There may be other factors, but we certainly believe it's an important component. Next, please. And so, this is what's changed our whole thinking. We now have the ability, using this new technology called seeding amplification assays, to take a patient's sample that contains, say you have Parkinson's, that patient's sample then can contain the minutest amount of this misfolded alpha-synuclein. Then you mix it with a large amount of normal alpha-synuclein. Not from the patient, we create the protein, it's manufactured, and we're able then to mix that with a test sample. You then put it with a, what's called an amyloid-sensitive dye. You don't need to know all the details. You put it in this wonderful machine, it shakes it all up and does its thing, and then through the course of this process, you develop these seeds. Remember I told you about the fibrils and the, the formation of the protein, and we can record these curves. This is an abnormal curve telling us that this test sample contained the abnormal synuclein, and this is a negative result. And you see the very significant difference between a positive and a negative uh, result. Now, unfortunately, to date, this is just what we call a quantitative test. It's not a quali, or it's not a quali I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It's a qualitative, not a quantitative test. So we say the protein is there in an abnormal form. We don't know how much it's there. It doesn't correlate with how severe your disease is. And it's very likely you can have it at the early, various earliest stages. Next, please. These are two wonderful researchers, researchers that work with us. Um, and uh, Yvonne Martinez Valbuena is our biochemist who has done some beautiful work to teach us how we can define the presence of this abnormal protein in Parkinson's and another synuclein disease called multiple system atrophy. Next, please. I think I'm gonna have to skip this for time because I need to move the slides quickly to allow us to do this. Okay, leave it there. Um, what we're now able to do, and this is an important study that was just published uh, earlier this year, 
and you just look at the red line. In Parkinson's, in the spinal fluid, we can find the presence of this abnormal protein with a, about 90% sensitivity and specificity. This is unheard of. We now have a diagnostic test that will say whether you have Parkinson's disease or not have Parkinson's. It's not 100% sensitive or specific, but what did you have before? You had a neurologist that examined you and the neurologist often was wrong. So we've got a test now that really changes. Next, please. Is there any way you could get me another mouse that will work? And so this is a study that was what's called a review and meta-analysis and showed overall multiple studies in the spinal fluid. You see here, 90%, 96% sensitive and specific. Next, please. And not only are we able to do this in the spinal fluid, we can take a biopsy of your skin and find very similar results. So that abnormal protein exists outside the brain and outside the spinal fluid, and we're very actively pursuing the skin because it's not very practical. If you had to go see your neurologist and you needed a lumbar puncture to make a diagnosis, there aren't too many people that want to do that, right? But we need more reliable tests. And so, next please. The blue line shows you that this same review found in fact that the skin was equally sensitive and specific to the spinal fluid. Next, please. I apologize for, for this. It's not their fault either, but this is just not working. Um, and we have a pilot study that I expect should be finished within the next month. This is the beginning of the study that Mar uh, Yvonne Martinez Valbuena uh, did. And you see here we had four groups of individuals, healthy controls, patients with this other alpha-synuclein disease called multiple system atrophy, people with Parkinson's disease, and others with progressive supranuclear palsy. The red is negative, the green are positive. So you see most of the healthy controls were negative, but in fact, some of them are positive. But in fact, if you take normal brains, people that live till they're 75 or so, about 10 to 15% of normal brains will have the pathology of Parkinson's disease. Whether it's going to mature to showing clinical symptoms in life or not, we don't know. Most of them don't. They've died of another cause. And so we do know that you can have this abnormal protein in your brain without showing any symptoms. And that's going to be very important to come back to in a, in a few minutes. The vast majority of patients with Parkinson's were green or positive, as were those with multiple system atrophy. But this tau disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, were negative. And what's on the y-axis is something called neurofilament light. It's a blood test that helped us separate out this more aggressive disease, multiple system atrophy, with more rapid brain degeneration to, compared to Parkinson's, which is a much more slowly progressive disease. Next, please. Okay, so this is the development that I'm telling you about, and I'm going to have to keep an eye on the clock here. Um, we... Not sure what he's doing now. <laughs> okay, um, and I'll explain this. Let's just move on. Ah, it's working now. So, James Parkinson described the condition of Parkinson's disease in 1817. He had six patients. Believe it or not, he only examined three, and he saw three on the streets of London, England. And it was 50 years later that a very famous neurologist from France and Paris, a Charcot, said, Parkinson's was magnificent. He described all the features in this beautiful little book called The Essay on the Shaking Palsy. And so he dubbed the disease Parkinson's disease. Now we haven't improved very much since Parkinson first described it. Believe it or not, we're still dependent on the clinician examining you and sometimes seeing you on the street and seeing you're a bit slow or you have a shaking hand or whatever. And so over several years, myself and several of my colleagues have been arguing we've got to move on. We've got to really look at this disease in a different way. We need to change our criteria. And so the Movement Disorders Society, MDS, in 2015 now, believe it, it's quite a long time surprisingly, based on our need to change, developed new diagnostic criteria, but they still relied on the clinical examination. Now the second paper at the bottom there recognized something called prodromal Parkinson's disease. And those of you with Parkinson's in the audience might remember that you 
might have lost your sense of smell years before your tremor started. You might have been constipated for several years, or you might have had some anxiety before, or depression. These features we now recognize can predate, are part of the disease, and can predate the more overt slowness, stiffness, tremor that the neurologist sees and is good at diagnosing, can predate it for 10 or more years before. So we now think of the prodromal phase of the disease with many of these other symptoms, including a form of sleep disorder, we need to be able to know who has the prodromal disease when our, remember I told you about that monoclonal antibody that failed? It's not gonna to continue to fail forever. We're going to have the treatments that can be useful to slow the progression, and if we can't diagnose the disease until somebody comes to me with slowness and shakiness, the disease is pretty established by that point, and we'd like to get it far more early to be able to initiate protective therapy when it can be do its best. So we need to move away from the clinical diagnosis and think of this disease biologically. We know that it affects the brain and even outside the brain, the peripheral nervous system for a decade, at least before, and we now have this technological advance I've told you about. We have the seeding amplification assays that I can apply now with pretty good sensitivity and specificity, like I said, over 90%, to be able to think about this condition, not on the clinical phase, but in the biological sense. So we've reached a point where we have diagnostic tools and we, get, we need to think about this the way the Alzheimer's field have been dealing with Alzheimer's for well over 10 years. I'm gonna explain that now. In Alzheimer's disease, or AD, they have two proteins. We have the one protein, alpha-synuclein. They have the protein amyloid A, and they have a second protein called tau. It's in, in a slightly different kind of tau from the one I told you about, PSP. And we know in Alzheimer's disease, you have cerebrospinal fluid measurements of the presence of amyloid. Then the amyloid we can measure in the brain using positron emission tomography. And then after that, we begin to see the tau form in the cerebrospinal fluid and in, in PET scanning. Then we begin to see the degenerative process in the brain, and then, and only then, does the patient start to have memory problems. So look at all this stuff that's going on long before anyone starts to get memory problems in Alzheimer's disease. And so that's where we're seeing the move. And this is the most impressive study that's just come out uh, uh, this past summer called the Trailblazer ALTS-2. This was a randomized trial using an anti-amyloid antibody. So the amyloid is the protein. They use the antibody to try to remove the protein. The line, straight line here is PET scanning, positron emission tomography for amyloid in people who receive placebo. These are the PET scans in people who receive the active monoclonal antibody. Look at that, plummeted, completely removed the abnormal protein, and with that, we saw a change in the progressive decline of cognitive function in the placebo group compared to the active treatment. And what's even more important is that if we compare, now I should tell you, step back a little bit, the amyloid sets up a cascade. We believe that that protein tau is the most important trigger to the degeneration. So you can have amyloid in your brain. If you don't have much tau, we believe you may not get the degeneration, you may not get the memory problems of Alzheimer's. Look at the difference here in patients who had little or no tau in their brain compared to those who had high tau levels. All of that clinical benefit I told you about was seen exclusively in people at the earliest stages before the tau was deposited. So now we're seeing that looking at these degenerative diseases biologically makes perfect sense. And if we think about it just clinical tremor, slowness, stiffness, we're missing the boat. We need to move to the biology. And that was the whole point of what our group did. We looked at Parkinson's and said we need to think of pathological synuclein. We need to look at evidence for degeneration in the brain. And unfortunately, our ability to do that is somewhat limited now. And then in Parkinson's, in contrast to Alzheimer's, a reasonable proportion of patients with Parkinson's have a genetic predisposition. So we felt we needed to incorporate genetics as well. It's still a small proportion, but it's an important proportion. And only after we define patients on the basis of their synuclein, 
their neurodegeneration, their genetic status, then we start thinking about defining their clinical features. And so we've coined the term synergy, synuclein, neurodegeneration, and genetics, to emphasize that incredible important relationship and interaction between those principal components of this uh, concept of um, disease classification. So big advance, the seeding amplification, but we need to recognize that not everybody with Parkinson's has synuclein. There are certain genetic forms of Parkinson's that doesn't, don't deposit synuclein. So one of the points that we're trying to emphasize by this classification is that we're not dealing with a single disorder. That's naive. We're dealing with a very, very broad, complex, heterogeneous disorder. Most people have the synuclein in their brain, and we can define them. But to ignore the people that don't have the synuclein doesn't do the, them any service and doesn't do the field justice. And so what we've done is we've used the seeding amplification assays. Don't worry about the details here. These are tables that I've used to talk about this before. But just to show you, we've endorsed in this proposal seeding amplification in the skin, the cerebrospinal fluid, and something called immunohistofluorescence and immunohistochemistry in the skin, and you don't have to worry about the details. What's really cool, though, is that there are groups now that are on the verge of blood tests. So we may not even have to take your skin. We certainly may not have to take your spinal fluid. These are different studies that are looking at ways that we may be able to measure the presence of the abnormal synuclein in the blood. And that's really going to break this field wide open. You're going to go see your doctor. And this, this isn't a decade away. This is probably in the next couple of years. The, I, we have groups, and we're working on this ourselves to try to confirm these really exciting preliminary results. There are also going to be scans of the brain for synuclein. We already know that the first tracer for alpha synuclein is positive in this other synuclein disease called multiple system atrophy. It was negative in Parkinson's, interestingly. But this field is blowing up. These are all of the studies that are trying to develop positron emission tomography tracers for Parkinson's disease. So this field is moving very aggressively and rapidly. For example, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has a huge multi-million dollar reward for the researchers who come up with the first PET ligand for alpha synuclein. So that's synuclein. Neurodegeneration, we're not as good at. We don't have really good markers of when your brain is beginning to degenerate in Parkinson's. Most of the studies are limited to the ability of, to look at dopamine. You may have heard about the DAT scan, dopamine transporter scan. It's um, approved in Canada, but not funded. So if you've got $3,000 in your pocket and you want to spend it and have a DAT scan, you can spend it. Most of the time you don't need a DAT scan. But if you're going to have research looking at whether there is degeneration in your dopamine system, we need to look at something like a DAT scan. But we need other methods of uh, looking at degeneration. And so this slide shows you some of the pictures. This is the DAT scan of a patient with Parkinson's disease. Your left brain controls your left brain. I don't know left, right. Your left brain controls your right body. So if you have too little dopamine in my left brain, I have more symptoms on the right side of my body, and that's exactly what this patient has. You see the bright signal is smaller in the left side of your brain compared to the right, whereas the normal individual has nice symmetrical, big comma-shaped things that uh, indicate the presence of the dopamine. And we look at another kind of brain scan called a um, fluorid uh, deoxyglucose scan. And this is interesting, not available readily here in Canada. We can do it, but it's mainly used for other purposes. This is something called an MIBG spec scan that looks at your noradrenaline nerves supplying your heart. So the you have normal noradrenaline, like adrenaline, but noradrenaline is another neurotransmitter. You have nerves that control your heart and supply your heart. And in Parkinson's, you lose those noradrenaline cells. And the MIBG spec has the ability to show what's called the absence of the heart silhouette. You see the green signal here? That's the heart with the normal noradrenaline nerves. And here it's gone. It's absent. And that indicates degeneration outside the brain. These are nerve cells that are coming from your spinal cord out to your heart. So we can measure the presence of this disease outside the brain as well as inside the brain. 
And then there are a number of other techniques that are still considered research. So this is a table just saying basically what I've said already. As I mentioned, a certain proportion of patients with Parkinson's have a genetic cause or an important genetic predisposition, but we have to recognize that they're not all dominantly inherited, 100% inheritance. This isn't Huntington's disease, fortunately. Huntington's disease, very serious other neurological brain disease. You have the gene, you live long enough, you get Huntington's. In Parkinson's, most of the genes, you don't necessarily have to inherit it in, and show the disease, even if you have a mutation in that gene. And uh, you remember that LRRK2 gene I mentioned very quickly in one of the slides. That's a disease that um, if you have the gene, you may only have what's called penetrance of about 30, 40%, depending on what kind of population you come from. And some of these genetic disorders don't have synuclein deposited and others do. So another complicated table just to say we chose some fully penetrant, highly um, um, penetrant genes, and then others that are um, highly or strongly predisposing to the disease. And then we came up with a number of designations. The details are not that important. But if you have no family history and have Parkinson's, you will be synuclein positive. You'll have evidence for neurodegeneration in the dopamine system, for example, and you won't have a gene. You'll be G negative. So typical sporadic Parkinson's, the majority of people with Parkinson's here are S positive, N positive, G negative. Whoops, can I go back? Whereas, if you have a fully penetrant gene, too much of the synuclein gene, you have genetic Parkinson's even if you don't have neurodegeneration or synuclein, you should have synuclein but, uh, because it's the synuclein gene. So we've subdivided each of these categories. The details are not important. And only then, as I told you, do we talk about clinical. And so we've defined those clinical features that could possibly relate to Parkinson's and those that probably relate to Parkinson's. And again, detail's not important, just to recognize the synergy, and then, only then, do we apply clinical. And now it's going the wrong way. <laughs> this is really quite, ex quite an experience. It's okay. So we feel that the biological classification that I've really rapidly introduce you to. At, uh, this is like uh, supersonic speed. Uh, I've normally had a lot more time to discuss a complicated concept to, to physicians, and I'm really snowing you with a lot of details here. But we feel that this approach is mandatory before we make, take the next steps of all sorts of uh, investigation and research. How do we interpret new imaging studies of the brain? How do we interpret what we call epidemiological studies, knowing who has or has not Parkinson's if we don't know that they're synuclein positive or negative or neurodegeneration positive. A lot of our old research is really walking with blindfolds on and we're now at a stage where we can start removing the blindfolds and think about the concepts of biology. It's not just a clinical disease because it's there in your brain and your nervous system for at least 10 to 20 years before you ever show any clinical symptoms. So we've got to do this before we ever reach the point of using what we talk about as precision medicine. None of us believe we're going to have one pill for everybody with Parkinson's. It's likely we're going to have pills for specific subtypes and probably combination therapies like cancer, combining cocktails of therapies, knowing more about the biology of your Parkinson's, not Mrs. Smith's Parkinson's, right? And that's going to be really critical. This is now exclusively for research. We do not recommend that you wonder if you've got Parkinson's and you've got to go out and get the testing. That's not going to help you and it's not going to help anybody, maybe just make you anxious. This is strictly for research now. And we have a lot of ethical hurdles to, to surpass. And I told you, a proportion of people who are perfectly normal and will live a nice, normal life to a ripe old age, have an alpha synuclein in their brain, and why should we tell them that they've got synuclein brain and worry them? So there's a big ethical question that we need to deal with and we need large scale studies following people over long periods of time to find out 
who with that alpha synuclein in their brain is going to manifest the disease and who might be protected and what protects them or what causes you to manifest. It's likely that there are going to be things on both sides of this equation. So this requires a lot more research. And there are going to be revisions of this approach over time. We're going to be adding new things, new understandings of the role of the environment. Remember I told you about the uh, epigenetics. That's going to be incorporated into this. New biomarkers of synuclein and other proteins. I told you about blood tests. We're going to be adding a lot of things to this. And subgrouping patients, as I've told you, for all the right reasons. And other methods of studying people with PET scans of microglial activation, how much inflammation you have in your brain, for example, or how are the synapses degenerating and what can we do to change that? We have PET scans that are capable now of looking at these things and maybe we'll incorporate these into the next iteration of this classification. So I've given you lots of information. I hope I haven't confused you or snowed you too much and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Thanks. We have had some questions coming in on Slido. I did, I did want to canvas the uh, audience here at the BMS, BMO Center first, and I see a question from the gentleman in the back row there. Jen, can you bring the microphone to him if you want to? We're assuming he's a gentleman, though, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I, first of all, thank you very much. I mean, this was extremely impressive, and it's so glad, I'm so glad to see this. Uh, when I first found out I had Parkinson's four years ago, I did my dilettantish little work on trying to understand what it was all about. And I was astonished to see that uh, how, how old levodopa was and how it's still really the, the, the frontline treatment for it. And I wondered why we weren't any further with it. Well, we're getting there now, and I, and I appreciate what you guys It's a great, doing. great observation and question. It's remarkable how lucky we were when levodopa was discovered. In fact, it was discovered for the wrong reasons to begin with, and I won't go through the details there, but it really is quite astounding that we got it right so well the first time. Just think of all of the other degenerative diseases where we don't have good symptomatic therapy. Why replacing one transmitter was going to be so su successful, no one really could have predicted. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. The, the, what, what, I, I wanted to, to ask, with alpha cytokine, if, you, if you're... What is the mechanism of getting rid of it? Like, what, how do you, where does it go to when you kill it, when you get rid of it? Yeah, so there are many different types of treatments that are being developed to try to deal with synuclein. So, for example, one might be to form less synuclein. You have normal synuclein, remember that permissive ten templating concept. Maybe if you have less of the normal synuclein around, the abnormal synuclein will have less of it to template and cause the progression of the disease. So there are treatments designed to reduce the amount of synuclein you make, changing the way your RNA functions, for example. There are other treatments that may be designed to change the aggregation of the protein, to make it less aggregated. There may be other treatments, like the monoclonal antibodies, that will attach to synuclein and then remove that. You'll get it out of your bloodstream and maybe pee it out or whatever. Your, your body will be able to deal with it and break it down properly. And so there are many different steps that are being considered for trying to get rid of synuclein, and it might be that we have to combine more than one of those in single patients. So we just don't know. We'll continue with questions, and uh, maybe, Kaylin, if you want to pick up somebody in the audience here. But first, Tony, I wouldn't mind going to the Slido question. The first one is a great one, because just for a little context, uh. everyone, just so you know, <laughs> Researchers and scientists like Dr. Lang here at UHN chase about 700 different sources of granting and f grants and funding to support their work. That's a lot of time. I know grant time here is everybody is in full on panic mode, filling out grant applications to be able to continue their work. Do you mind addressing the first question? How do donations help your clinic and research programs such as the one you've talked about in your presentation? Love to answer that, thank you. Uh, boy, that Anonymous really sort of stepped in beautifully. Um, thank you, Anonymous. Um, research dollars uh, or donations, philanthropy, support every aspect of the program. So for example, if you're seen in our program, very commonly some of our fellows may be caring for you. 
Our fellows' salaries are paid out of our research dollars. Um, our fellows are involved in multiple research studies, and I've shown you some of them. Our basic scientists are all supported. So Ivan Martinez Valbuena, uh, the man that is doing all of this incredible biology work with the biochemistry of alpha synuclein, is paid entirely out of philanthropy, his whole salary and his whole research program, as well as Naomi Vasanji. I showed you Naomi as well. So the salaries of these researchers and the um, costs of doing research and uh, working in the laboratory are all supported. Uh, now, obviously, once we get moving, you can apply for funding from CIHR or other sources. But do you know how hard it is to get funded by CIHR now? Even the most senior investigators, full professors, well supported, are expecting now that most of the time their grants are turned down at least two times before sometimes they get uh, their application in successfully the third time. Just think about the amount of wasted time spent writing these darn grants. And so what we like is to be able to use that research dollars to jump on something, to get moving and to be able to pivot and do something quickly. Somebody's found a blood test, let's confirm. Let's do it quick and define whether we can apply that to our patients. So those are the kind of things your philanthropic support provide us to do. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Anonymous. We have another question. Jen? Hi there. I'm just wondering, for, for many years when we were looking at tau and amyloid around our Alzheimer's, there was concern about whether or not these were byproducts of the disease process or the act of bad actors. I'm wondering where we are in terms of understanding whether alpha synuclein is in fact itself the bad actor or a byproduct of another process that might be that's driving the disease. That's a brilliant question that's going to take forever to answer. I guess um, many ways of thinking about that. There are people that still think that it's an epiphenomenon or a byproduct. I don't think that that represents the uh, common beliefs now. And what really changed, and this happened in Alzheimer's first and then Parkinson's, is the discovery of genes for those proteins that were associated with the disease. So that's more than coincidence. You just can't get that. We know that the brain contains alpha-synuclein and it's aggregated and accumulating in these brain cells that are damaged and are dying, and son of a gun, a mutation in the, pro in the DNA that makes that protein causes the disease. Too much, if you have three copies of the gene, you make too much of the protein, you get the disease. So we can't ignore that. And then there's all sorts of biology working on how synuclein may trigger the pathologic process. Now in some cases, there may be other factors that could end up triggering the synuclein. We know the majority of people don't have a mutation in the alpha-synuclein gene, right? So maybe there are other processes that end up triggering and accumulating and causing the damage to the protein and the misfolding. But we can't ignore that that then could accelerate the process and plays a really critical role. Keelan, I think we had a gentleman in the second row here who had a question here in the BMS Center, and then we'll go back to our Slido questions. Hi. Hi, Tony. How you doing? Great, how you doing? Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, this Parkinson's, as, as you, you, you were just saying, is, it comes in so many different forms, so many subgroups. And I'm wondering, the, the type with alpha synuclein, it comes, do we know what subgroups that can, do, I guess what I'm saying is, are we learning how to, how to bunch those and, and break down and, and decide what symptoms come with which Yeah, so uh, everybody, I should mention Gord is the chair of our uh, patient advisory board and we can't go do anything without the uh, involvement of our patients in what we do. Um, so that's, that's a question I think that will, be answered as we start to apply this kind of classification. We will probably now start to have to look at patient subgroups based on the biology to see whether there are ways of separating and subdividing. We've been doing patient classifications and subtyping for years, and most of it's been totally, um, uh, Connie Maris and myself wrote a paper a long time ago called uh, Lost in Translation. And the title meant that we've not taken these subdivisions and translated it to the next stage of understanding research. None of our studies in um, uh, treatment have really been that influenced by these subdivisions. So we need to understand the biology before we can do the subdividing properly. Thank you. I'm going to get to these questions here on the, this side of the room in a second. I just want to go back to Slido. 
from Jerry. Are there any cures, Dr. Lang, for Parkinson's multiple system no. atrophy disease? Sadly, there are no cures for any neurodegenerative disease. We're now beginning to see the stones breaking down in the wall. You know, the Berlin Wall is beginning to crumble a little bit maybe, but uh, no, we don't have cures. Um, we don't have any drug that slows the progression of these diseases. We're beginning to see it in Alzheimer's, as I kept emphasizing. And so the hope is we're going to start seeing it in Parkinson's and MSA. We've got to see it in MSA. That's a terrible disease. And uh, I hope that this kind of work will uh, eventually make that difference. Back to our audience members here, this gentleman with the plaid. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for this talk. It was very enlightening. My question is, you guys are now looking at non-clinical diagnosis, which is amazing because of somebody living with Parkinson's, my clinicals are up here, but underwater are all my other symptoms that have been present for 10 years. The question is, I've noticed a lot that they're dividing people into where they think it's coming through their nose or coming through their stomach. So the nose often will start with lack of smell and taste, and the stomach starts with constipation. And these are usually traced back 10 to 20 years. And I'm wondering if you guys are looking at that division in Parkinson's. Yes, yeah. So this is... Um Part of that, remember that slide with prodromal disease existing 10 or more years before? Olfactory deficits, loss of the sense of smell, constipation, very common early symptoms. Now, are they, um, the way the disease got into you, and that's one possibility. Your environment comes closest to you through the nose and through the gut, right? And so there's a strong belief that your environment changes you by something you sniffed in or something you swallowed and digested, and that then triggered a variety of processes that ended up with Parkinson's. The other alternative is that those are secondary to the disease in, the disease is already there and you get constipated because the nerves to your bowel get sleepy, they get damaged. Or the, and we know that the olfactory nerve is the cranial nerve number one, that's why you smell, it's a, a brain nerve, uh, we know that that's damaged and has synuclein in it. So is that because something came in or is something went out? We don't, and there's a belief of what's called the body first concept of Parkinson's, starting outside the brain and spreading to the brain, and the brain first, starting in the brain and spreading out, and it may be bidirectional, and it may differ from person to person. Exactly. And that's why we need to separate people out on the basis of biology. <laughs> Let's stick with our audience here at the BMO Center for one more gentleman in the second row and then our young lady here in the white. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my question relates to the biological classification. For it to have impact, it needs to be applied consistently across the research community. This will allow the stratification of patients and categorize them in their response rates to different monoclonal antibodies, for instance. Can you talk about what has to happen for this to become at least a Western world standard, particularly as it relates to influencing the FDA and the other major pharma companies? So just walk through the standard setting process, please. That's a real tough one. Um, this is just coming out. So this is, uh, will be published in um, the leading clinical neurology journal called The Lancet Neurology probably in the next couple of months. There is another proposal from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, interestingly, that is largely driven by sporadic synuclein positive Parkinson's, so not the overall heterogeneous approach that we're taking, exclusively with dopamine transporter spec abnormalities, and it's designed to drive clinical trials. So it's very specific for that purpose. We believe that the pro proposal we're making is more broadly applicable and can be used for all sorts of different kinds of research. What has to happen is that this needs to be looked at in large populations now. We have to first have the, the field read these papers and decide how they're going to accept or reject. So what I'm pre presenting you is something I've been working on for the last year and a half and I believe very strongly in. I may have to go home with my tail between my legs and accept that it is not widely uh, acceptable, but I think in the presentations myself and my colleagues have made, this is being highly appreciated. 
Um, but it's going to take large studies, and we're already starting to talk about uh, looking for grant funding to look at this uh, concept in large normal individual populations as well as patients with the earliest manifestations of the disease. And we've got to do that to show that it's useful. So this really needs to walk bef or crawl before it can walk and run. Jen, we have another question from the lady in the front row. Yeah, just uh, maybe a little off topic, but have there been advancements in DBS and um, is it still a successful treatment? Yeah, so deep brain stimulation, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Fasano and Dr. Munoz from our group are world experts in that. Uh, lots of advances have been developed. It's a very effective treatment for reasons that we don't quite understand, mainly effective for people who have a good levodopa response. So if your response is poor to levodopa, it's going to be poor to deep brain stimulation. If your response is fluctuant, but at your best, you're still very good with levodopa, you have a good chance of having a good response to deep brain stimulation. So it's especially helpful for people who have some of the complications of levodopa over many years. So we would never operate on somebody at the earliest stages of the disease. It is not neuroprotective. So there was a hope and belief by some that would actually slow the progression of the disease. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Where it's advancing is new technologies, new kinds of electrodes, new kinds of batteries, new kinds of programming methods, and that field is changing very rapidly. Dr. Lang, let's go back to our Slido questions from the live stream group. Another anonymous question, when can we hear more about stem cell research to cure Parkinson's? It won't. Um, there was a time when the naive concept, and I, I'm, I hope I'm not offending Anonymous here, uh, the hope was that stem cells were going to cure because you just put stem cells in and that replaces your brain cells, right? Logical. In fact, stem cells are dumb. They're just cells that turn into other cells. It's like your bone marrow. You have bone marrow cells that make your white blood cells, your red blood cells, your platelets. You have stem cells that can create all sorts of what are called cell lineages. And so what we do with stem cells is force them down lines to manufacture specific types of cells. You can't put a stem cell into the brain and say, okay, do your thing. They're dumb. They don't know that you're deficient of dopamine cells or noradrenaline cells or serotonin cells or acetylcholine cells. You've got all sorts of different types of cells in your brain that are affected in Parkinson's. So to think that you can use a single source like a stem cell to just deal with the whole biology of this very complex disease is, is, it just doesn't work. And I would argue with stem cell researchers about this for a long time. What it does very well though, is that it manufactures dopamine cells. And there is a hope that using stem cells driven down to develop dopamine cells, you'll have an, a large infinite number of dopamine cells and then taking people who are very responsive to, park, to levodopa or who are at the earliest stages that we know will respond to levodopa well, you may be able to replace the dopamine cells in that area that is deficient of dopamine. It's not going to cure all of the complex nature of the disease, but it may be very useful for a selected part of the disease. So unfortunately, it's not going to be a cure, but it may be very, very useful. And in, I should say, and I'll finish it, Going on, some of the genetic forms. Um, there are some of the genes that are inherited by what's called a, a recessive method of inheritance. So you need two abnormal genes, one from your father, one from your mother. And so if you inherit these two abnormal genes, then you have Parkinson's on a recessive basis. A dominant disease is just coming from your father down, grandfather, grandmother, comes down multiple uh, uh, generations. But recessive diseases, you have to have both parents of, with an abnormal gene. One abnormal gene alone is not enough. So your mother and father are well. They don't know they've got the abnormal gene, but they pass the two abnormal genes. And there are a couple of forms of Parkinson's that are inherited that way that are very, almost exclusively dopamine degenerations. They don't have the olfactory abnormalities. They don't have the constipation. They don't have the complex nature of what is typical of most people with Parkinson's. They may be great candidates 
for dopamine cell replacement therapies. I think most of us believe they're the ideal candidate. And that might cure the disease in those small number of patients. Dr. Lang, last question from okay. Slido, Hugh Johnston. Can you tell us why from a patient and care partner POV, this biological classification system will be used primarily for research? And if you foresee ways patients who currently have Parkinson's can benefit? I think that if we deal with the disease biologically, it's more likely we're eventually going to have treatments that are directed selectively to people with certain biologies. And if that's the case, it may be a while before we're gonna get there, then we're going to have precision medicine therapies that will have an effect on patient, patients with Parkinson's. This is not current. So don't expect that something tomorrow is gonna to come of this work that's going to influence the average patient with Parkinson's disease. And I really emphasize research needs to move and research is slow to move sometimes. But we've gotta take those steps. This is gonna be crawling before we walk, before we run, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Hugh, I wish I could tell you it would be applicable tomorrow, but I think if it's applicable tomorrow, it's gonna to hurt people. And in fact, if you want and your doctor wants, they can do a cerebrospinal fluid test, send it to a laboratory in the United States and you will get your synuclein test right back within a couple of weeks. They can do a biopsy of your skin and they can look at it and find synuclein in your skin. How's that gonna affect you? If you've got typical Parkinson's disease, very likely you've got synuclein, right? So it's not going to affect your knowledge of your disease and what happens if it's negative? You don't know if it's negative because you don't have synuclein, or it could be that it's a false negative test. Remember, I didn't say it's 100% sensitive or specific. That's the problem with laboratory tests. They're not always right. So if we tried to apply this clinically, I think we could do more harm than good. But eventually, I think it's gonna have a big impact. We have gone over our time. You want one last one? certainly possible. So we don't know if fecal transplantation was effective, and that's a big, big if, uh, with multiple I's and multiple F's with a lot of exclamations after it, right? Um, if it were effective or changed the course, we don't know how often you'd need it. You probably would have to have it multiple times over your life. We don't know. We've actually gone over our time. Thanks, everybody, for being so engaged with Dr. Lang's talk today. And I want to thank Dr. Tony Lang, Round of applause for Ms. Dr. Lang. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, a thank you to all of you who came down to the BMO Center today and to those of you on the live stream. We'll be returning with another edition of the Movement Disorders virtual speaker series, so keep an eye on your email inbox. This event has been recorded, so if you want to pass this on to friends and family, the UHN Foundation YouTube channel will have this up shortly. And finally, if you are moved to donate to the Movement Disorders Program, uh, the pioneering work that goes on here to improve patient care and find new treatments and cures and diagnostics, uh, please donate to the Movement Disorders Research Fund. We'll include the details on how you can do that in our post-event email. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and on the live stream, and stay safe, everyone.